Welcome to it, sports fans from the Bleachers FTB TV podcast, episode 24, 25th of January. Remember, we're on iTunes, Podbean, and YouTube. YouTube. Episode 24, so we're on iTunes, of course, and Podbean as the FTB TV podcast. So on YouTube, it is from the Bleachers, and on Facebook, from the Bleachers TV. I'm not even going to do an intro today. There's no need for it. What are we talking about? It's Pogba. Does uh, does he deserve any credit post-Jose? How should people be viewing Paul Pogba? And many people have been saying, I don't give him any credit post-Jose, even though I've been critical. So I'm going to give you my thoughts on Pogba again post-Jose. Does he deserve any credit? Because I've given him a hard time. And then we're going to talk about have South African batsmen be, been getting away with it for the pro tiers? The bowling's been unbelievable for four years. Have the batsmen been really enjoying a kind of honeymoon for four years? And then it is the Friday Five, my favorite thing to do. This week it is the five greatest center backs. So I'm going to give that a go. I remember the FTB TV podcast, iTunes, Podbean, and YouTube. YouTube, it is the FTB TV podcast. We're going to get straight into it. Does Paul Pogba deserve more credit? Post Jose. I'm going to start with this. So imagine for a second, we go for a hike. Imagine I'm the other person, whoever you are. And we get thirsty, as people do. And we see a river. And we wander down to the river to quench the thirst. As we get to the river, though, you push me into the river. Okay? So you push me into the river. Let's say you think I stole your dream girl when we were 13 years old. And you just can't let it go. And this was your moment. And you couldn't contain the rage anymore. You thought, this guy, I haven't forgotten this. It was 20 years ago. But he's going down. So you push me into the river. Boom. And you've got me back. you got your revenge. Now I'm in a raging river. Flying towards my death. Imagine every single circumstance. So here's where the crazy. The, the, the story would get great though. After rescuing me right. Oh, because, Well first of all. Because you're not Charles Manson. The guilt is too much for you. Your conscience kicks in. You run down the river. And you save me. But here's where the story would get great. After you rescue me, then you say, dude, I rescued you. And then you're like waiting for a thank you from me. Like, this is where the story would be. I'd be like, dude, you pushed me in. Plus Inga, when we were 13, chose me. Although that's not the point. I'm not giving you credit for rescuing a nightmare you created. Dude, I literally watched you push me in. Like, how am I going to thank you for rescuing me after you pushed me into the river? It's ridiculous. It's mental. Do you know what? I read an article yesterday, or earlier this morning, Ole Gunnar Solskjaer saying, Paul Pogba is captain material. That was essentially the message behind the article. Quote, unquote, Paul Pogba is captain material. Listen, so Paul Pogba in six games post Mourinho has five goals, five assists, and is dabbing everywhere. He's living it, living his best life. Everybody keeps saying to me, hey, how come you don't give Pogba credit now? Five goals, five assists, no Jose. You see, the problem with me is that I'm haunted by this thing. It's a curse. It's called having perspective. Right? Man United fans, you can't have it both ways. You can't say you have to get rid of Jose. He doesn't get the United way. And then at the same time, you tell me Paul Pogba is captain and leader material for Man United. I saw those first 17 games. That's not going to work. That ain't going to work. I saw those 17 games. They did not happen. Just because you don't like something, it doesn't mean it didn't happen. Just because something doesn't fit your narrative, it doesn't mean it didn't happen. You see, when it comes to the United way regarding leadership... I think Steve Bruce, Brian Robson, Roy Keane, Nemanja Vidic. That's what I'm thinking. 
none of those guys sucked when things got tough. If anything, Fergie probably was successful because those guys kept the lid on, a, on massive characters in the dressing room. Fergie very rarely had to deal with issues. Steve Bruce, Brian Robson, Roy Keane, Nemanja Vidic. See, when your captain and leader wants to be popular with everyone, how can you lead people with things that are not ideal? Because that's when you need leadership. You don't need leadership when things are going well. Nobody has to lead when things are great and ideal. When things aren't going well, you need that character to make sure that standards are being met. So whether you're in business, at schools, in other teams, whatever it is you need, especially in team environments, the one guy who doesn't want to be buddy-buddy with everyone. Especially when the talent is this high. Because with talent comes ego, and if you don't have that one guy who's going to set the standard, it's a mess. Why do you think Real Madrid can't win the league? Sergio Ramos can only do so much, but I mean the egos are overflowing. But Fergie had Keane, Robson, Bruce, Vidic. You see, if it's about the United way, then I have to give Paul Pogba all the blame for what's happened to under Jose if he's going to get all the credit for what he's doing now. So I'm happy to give Pogba all the credit, right? If he's going to take all of the flack for the first 17 games, because those still happen. It's not just these six games that, that are part of a season. If it was a cup tournament, I'd go great. Listen, I know it's millennial time now and leadership will never change. Like, leadership will never change. I know it's millennials and everybody's special and everybody's an individual and the old generation must adjust, blah, blah, blah. Leadership doesn't change. It doesn't change. Listen, you can't just look for credit when things go well. Once again, that's not leadership. That's called being selfish. Like, I don't want to do anything, just tell me I'm good. That's not how it works at the top, especially when the margins are 1%. Listen, in any organization, who gets the most credit, right? When the company makes record profits, the CEO gets the most credit. He gets the biggest bonus. You know why that is? It's because he costs the company the most money. And what that means is he has to take the most responsibility. That's how it works. But listen, poor Pogba costs £90 million. Pounds. That's an insane amount of money. That is an insane amount of money for a midfielder in today's game. Manchester United, after 23 games, are in 6th place, 6th place, 16 points behind Liverpool. 16 one six. I can't ignore that. You can't push me in the river, save me, and then go, oh my goodness, dude, I saved you. Like, you should buy me a car. Like, what are you talking about? You pushed me in a friggin' raging river. Listen, I can't give you credit for nearly drowning me and then give you a purple heart for saving me. You put me in the mire. If you're a leader, you're going to take responsibility for that. Listen, I never thought I'd, I'd quote this man. I mean, Mario Balotelli said it best. You know, the guys were giving him credit. He was in good form for Man City a couple of years ago. And he said, why do you need to give me credit for doing my job when I score? Do you give the postman credit for delivering the mail? No, he's just doing his job. So Paul Pogba now, at 90 million, is just doing his job. But it's still only six games. You have to do your job for 23 games. 16 points behind Liverpool. Listen, I've just seen Paul Pogba when his character was needed. He shrank. He was just another guy. He was just another dude when they needed him. I'm not saying he's captain material. Ole Gunnar Solskjaer is. And Man United are really telling you what they think because look at the media. Look how they want him portrayed. He's everywhere. He is everywhere as the pinup boy for Manchester United. They think he's the guy. Listen, I guarantee you, I've seen the character. It crumbled when he needed to be the leader. He's just another guy. 
Man United are going to have to move on from Pogba within two years. If the United way is still the aim. They're going to have to move on from Paul Pogba if the United way is still the aim. Listen, from from my like leaders, right, in football, for them, it needs to be about football. It can't be Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, personalized emojis, hairstyles, pinstripe suits, and then football. That can't be the order. It can't go Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, personalized emojis, and your nice suits, and then football. But we know Pogba is obsessed with the show, which is which is great if you're delivering on the pitch. I'm happy with that. If you're delivering. But 16 points off Liverpool. And business is booming. So that's the difference, I think, in this day and age. It's what managers probably have to deal with. And it's why you need an even stronger person as captain. Because now guys are doing fashion lines. They're getting involved with apps. They've got their own emojis. And for my captain, I don't mind if he's just a guy... But if you're my captain, it's football first. I don't want to hear about your deal with whoever. I don't want to hear how much Adidas are paying you. I don't want to see your hairstyle. Button it up. And this isn't Brighton. This isn't Newcastle. This is Manchester United. Facebook, Twitter, hairstyles, pinstripe suits. That's not leadership. You can do all that if you're just a dude. But for me, if the United way is still a thing, I think Bruce, Robson, Keane, Vidic, leaders. Pogba is a glory boy. I'll take it back to the old school. We used to call them glory boys. And I may have to give Paul Pogba a little bit of credit But if I do that, then Manchester United fans have to accept that the United way is dead. Let me switch over to this, to the cricket. All right. Something I've been thinking about for a couple of years, but I've been looking at some of the numbers. And it's like, why isn't this Proteus current team legendary? Like, why does nobody ask themselves, how come the Proteus current team isn't legendary? They should be legendary. And the, song, the answer is quite simple and so sad. Listen, South Africa over the last four years have had three bowlers who statistically are objectively in the top 10 ever. So not just now, statistically, at the moment, South Africa has three bowlers that are in the top 10 ever ever if their careers were to continue on this trajectory and end in four or five years' time. They've also had Mornay and Morkel to support them. So three bowlers inside of the top 10 statistically ever, not right now, not, not compared to their contemporaries, ever. You can put McGrath, you can put Muir Litherin in there, you can put McGrath, Gillespie in there, you can put Brett Lee in there, you can put Kapil Dev in there, you can put Courtney Walsh in there. There's three guys right now playing for the Proteus and they have been the spearhead for the last four years who are in the top 10 statistically ever. And they've all taken above 150 wickets, so it's no it's no mean mugging. It's no like, oh, okay, it could be just a season. Also, to be clear, I don't count one-day cricket in this conversation at all. Like, I don't count one-day cricket in the conversation at all as to legendary. All right? But, so, let's do the obvious comparison. I mean, it's it's the, it's the Steve War Ricky Ponting size from 99 to 2000, right? That 2007 Australian victory, it was the first 5-0 Ashes series victory ever. Right? It put that team over the top. Because, remember, they had just gone three World Cups on the spin as well people count that and then they and then crucially they done what i think is the biggest prize in cricket they went to india and won people say oh the pro is won in 2000 but we know why there's an asterisk on that one you don't have to like what i'm saying but hansi krinya was in that team the pro won 2-0 in india 
And for those of you like me who watched it, and I've, I've watched it in hindsight, there's a massive asterisk. A massive asterisk on that series. Listen, India don't lose at home. They lost to, to England in 2013 in a brilliant series. But India since 2000, and I don't count South Africa's one because once again, Hansi Krinje is in the mix there and who knows what was going on. Since 2000, they've only lost two series at home. Australia managed to do that. My opinion, South African cricket is too much of a boys club. And listen, the batsmen have been on honeymoon for four years because Gahiso Rabada came in in the Indian tour in 2015. So I count from them. You know why Australia dominated cricket for 15 years? Leadership. That's the only difference between Australia and South Africa. War and Ponting were never popular dudes at all. Especially Steve War. Never popular. But guys knew what was expected to wear the baggy green. And you dip just below that. You can ask Matthew Hayden. He got dropped. You can ask Damon Martin. He got dropped. They all got dropped. You can ask Steve War himself. He was dropped early on. Ironically dropped for his brother. So leadership. It was all about we don't care about being liked. We want to win. We don't care about going to nightclubs and being cool and being celebrities. Steve Waugh didn't care about that. Ricky Ponting didn't care about that. They want to win three World Cups, tours to India, unbeatable at home, unbeatable for eight years. South Africa had Graham Smith and A.B. de Villiers. Like, could there be two more attention-seeking, want to be one of the boys, guys in the world? I don't think they could be. Listen, you can't win with that. Well... You can win, but when the rubber meets the road, as with anything where there's no leadership and there's some talent, then people need to be held accountable when the rubber meets the road. How do you keep people accountable if there's no leadership? If everyone's part of the boys club, if everyone's having a good time at the nightclub, if everyone's part of the lifestyle, you can't, you can't win with that. Listen, I know people who worked and continue to work for the Proteus and under Smith and AB, there was zero leadership. I have it on very, very strong authority that it is like talent. And you could see it. All the ta- It was all talent-based. Because I tell you what, both guys, AB de Villiers, Graham Smith, just want to be one of the guys. They want to go hang out at nightclubs. And Smith in particular, the accusation was never about the lifestyle of being fit. And that transcended because you could see Cullis was out of shape on occasion. Legend, no doubt. But when the captain isn't living the lifestyle, can't have your captain being overweight. Can't do that. Can't do that and hope to win. You think of Steve Waugh, one of the fittest guys ever. Panting, need I say more. Can't win with that. You can't win with your captain being overweight and repeatedly being in nightclubs and not living the life off the pitch. You can win because you got talent, you got colors, you got the bowlers. And recently, AB, you can win because AB is great. And then he's got three of the greatest bowlers of all time. But you can't win when the rubber meets the road, which is why the, the re- in the last four years, South Africa couldn't win in India, couldn't win in England. Listen, AB de Villiers took a sabbatical to go and record a music album when he was the Proteus captain. Uh, like... What world are we living in? Could you think of a world where Ricky Ponting, Alan Border, or Steve Waugh took time off? But when there's other things, lifestyle, image, wanting to be friends with everyone, wanting to be liked by everybody, when there's no leadership, I don't care how much talent you've got. The point is, South African cricket has wasted probably the best seam attack that the world has seen bar the West Indian, the four horsemen. If you don't know who I'm talking about, go and watch all the documentaries. There's about a thousand on YouTube. Holding, Roberts, Croft, and Garner. I don't need to say any more about that. That should send shivers down any cricket fan spine. But South African cricket has wasted the greatest seam bowling attack in modern day cricket. Because it's a one big boys club and nobody wants to hear that, guys, you can't live that lifestyle. 
It's not amateur cricket. You can't, you've got to be in pristine shape. Now, everybody's professional. I don't care how good you are. I don't care how great you are. Because our bowlers are great. But it's one big boys club. There's no clear leadership. A flat structure does not work in an elite environment. I don't care who you are. South African cricket, you've wasted the greatest bowling attack in modern day cricket. This team should be over the top. Listen, the two England series, home and away, those losses exposed the batting. 2016 and in 2017 in England. 2016 here, I mean that 83 at the Wanderers, I was there for that day. That showed me everything I needed to know. Vernon couldn't have done more in that series. Stan couldn't have done more in that series. Stan, Stan even got injured. And Verdon carried the load with the Rabada and the batting failed. And then they went to England and the batting failed again. How do you lose with this bowling attack in South Africa and in England where the bowling is unbelievable? It's sad. Don't want to hop on, but boys club, flat structure, everybody wants to be mates. There's no real captain. Everybody wants to be popular. Everybody wants to get along. Go and read the books. Go and read Steve Waugh's book. Go and read Ricky Ponting's book. Go and read Shane Warne's book. And you hear that Steve Waugh set a standard so high, even Shane Warne, who was really about that life, brought it around. He understood that his talent and Shane Warne is off the charts. Greatest bowler ever, I think. Even he was disciplined towards the end. My God. And there was no need for him to be disciplined because he had Gilchrist. He had Hayden. He had Langer. He had McGrath. He had Gillespie. He had Lee. He had da Damien Martin. They had it all in that Australia team. But they had war. And they went from border to war to ponting. South African cricket. It is so sad that we've wasted the greatest bowling attack in modern day cricket. To Stain, Rabada and Philander, I'm so sorry that the boys club is the best that we could do for you. To those three bowlers, they're going to have off the charts numbers when they're done. Vernon probably will be first to be done. Stain's probably in the twilight of his career. Rabada will lead this attack for the next decade. But I can see the next leadership group, still a boys club, no leadership, nobody who stands out, everybody just wants to be popular. And trust me, like I said, I know people who work inside and are medical professionals for the Proteas, so trust me, I talk to them often. Because this interests me, I like to know why people win, why do certain people win, why don't others win. And trust me, it's a boys club. Speaking of boys clubs, Friday Five, definitely my favorite segment. This, this uh, Today I'm doing the greatest center backs to ever play in the Premier League. Friday Five, I'm gonna, it's uh, when I give my list of top five in different segments. I've, I've done top, uh, the best strikers, the best uh, central midfielders. Today I'm doing the best, the greatest center backs to ever play in the English Premier League. So here we go. Today's Friday Five, of course, on the FTV TV podcast at number five. Listen, transfers very rarely work out in the Premier League. In fact, very few clubs ever get value for fee paid. So in 2008, on August the 22nd, Manchester City made one of the greatest value to fee signings of all time. Eight million pounds exchange hands between Manchester City and Hamburg. This one, we've seen a few a few teams recently try and splash the cash. But for the dressing room egos, they spill over with no leadership. And we've seen how many teams have flunked. People have tried to just throw money at the problem. I'm afraid that just does not work. Three Premier League titles and a statesman-like aura. Without a doubt, a legend in the Premier League. And he, he will go down in the annals and the history for me in the top five. Technical, strong a tremendous organizer and a statesman-like aura, as I said. At number five, the captain and leader of the revolution in Manchester, Vincent Company. 
at number four. Although his move from Tottenham to Arsenal makes him absolutely intolerable to Spurs fans. He was the best player they've ever had in Premier League history and they know it. Raw power, raw pace and positional sense like very few in Premier League history. This guy went on to be a juggernaut for Arsenal. And in 2004 was the rock that the Invincibles were built on. Two Premier League titles and a tremendous career for England. At number four, the physical freak, the animal. Arsene Wenger said he just couldn't, he couldn't ignore the sheer power that exuded that from Sol Campbell. He looked impenetrable. And that's why he signed him Sol Campbell at number four. At number three, so in 1998, Manchester United paid a then world record for a centre-back of £10.6 million, which back then was a fortune. That's 21 years ago. Fair enough, he was the Dutch player of the year, but even then it was seen by a gamble by Fergie. Well, to say this man proved his worth immediately is the understatement of the millennium. He became the fulcrum which powered Manchester United to England, uh, to, to, to sort of England's only treble, right? The only treble team that England have ever produced. As Manchester United that year ripped their way through the title, they ripped their way through to the title from Arsenal. They took their title back and won the FA Cup and broke Bavarian hearts in the UEFA Champions League final and did the treble. Listen, this man went on to, re, uh, to lead uh, United to a three-peat. That's three on the spin. One of the greatest Dutch players ever. At number three, Jörg Stamm. At number two, remember Porto did the double treble. So they won the league, the cup, and the Europa League. Then they won the, the league, the cup, and the Champions League in Portugal. Two on the spin. After this man won everything at Porto in 2003, Chelsea went and spent £20 million on a shaggy-haired defender and eyebrows were raised. I mean, £20 million. He went on to play at the Euros for Portugal and proved he was, he was probably good value at £20 mil, But £20 million was still a king's ransom. This, is what, this one's quite simple, really. He was the best defender in the best defence the Premier League has ever seen in 2004. It's still the best defense the Premier League's ever seen. They conceded, listen to this, 15 goals in the entire season. I didn't stutter, that's 1-5. Seemingly never out of position, an incredible athlete and a ball player who could have played, I'm convinced, in the middle. And listen, he loved a goal. He loved a goal. He loved to push up. And he's got a few crackers on his resume. At number two, Chelsea's greatest, undoubtedly Chelsea's greatest centre-back of all time, Ricardo Carvalho. At number one, in 2004-2005-2006, Chelsea and Mourinho felt like armed with Roman Abramovich's seemingly bottomless pocket. Right? He had bottomless pockets. It seemed as though after that 04-05-05-06 season, they might go on to be the second team to three-peat in the Premier League. Felt like Chelsea were unstoppable. But then, this man's transfer, actually, there's quite a backstory to it. It should not have happened because he had already signed for Fiorentina. But Italian teams back then had a cap on non-EU players that could be registered in each season. And they were already, uh, the, the La Viola were already at their limit. So Fiorentina had to wait until the end of the 2006 season in order to finalize the deal. So nothing was signed. The deal was agreed, but it couldn't be signed because Fiorentina already had their cap of, e, of non-EU players. Well, Ferguson being the wily old fox that he is, and as he did before with Roy Keane from Blackburn many years before, he did a deal on Christmas Day 2015 that changed the face of the Premier League as we've known it up until today. Christmas Day 2015 changed everything. Manchester United went on to three-peat again. They went on to win another Champions League title. Listen, this man in 2007, 2008, 2008, 2009 was not only the best centre-back in the league, he was the best player in the league. 
That's never happened. He didn't win player of the year. But listen to me, he wasn't just the best center back in the league. He was comfortably the best player. The most influential. He had he influenced results the most somehow from center back. He was a colossus. He was absolutely unstoppable. Ball player, a rock. He actually looked like a soldier. And listen to this. This is the most sickening part if you aren't a Manchester United fan. He cost £7 million. And he's easily the greatest defender the Premier League's ever seen. And quite comfortably the best value for money in football history. I don't care what transfers you look at. He cost £7 million on Christmas Day in 2015. The face of the Premier League was changed forever. Because at number one, the most complete defender, the most complete centre-back England has ever ever seen it sickens me to say it is Nemanja Vidic he was unbelievable for you youngsters who never got to see him I'm so sorry you've seen nothing like him we have never seen anything like Nemanja Vidic the Serbian machine five Vincent Company four Sol Campbell three Jopstam the stopper from Holland two Ricky Carvalho the genius from Portugal, and at number one, quite simply, the greatest defender the Premier League has ever seen. Three P Champions League changed the face of it all. That is your Friday Five, and that is from the Bleachers for today. Remember, iTunes, Podbean, YouTube, FTB TV podcast. Looking forward to a great weekend of the FA Cup, and indeed, looking forward to the Premier League next week. See you on Monday. Please subscribe, like, and go to iTunes and give us a five-star rating. I'll be back on Monday morning. For the weekend, enjoy the football, rugby, cricket, and it is the Australian Open tennis final. Novak Djokovic for the win.